The latest forecast track for developing Imelda shows it skirting along the coast but not making a southeast U.S. landfall. Regardless, the storm will bring significant rain and wind impacts. I'll discuss those impacts and how the storm could even turn back eventually. That's coming up. One Nation Weather. Let's start this update with a look at the official forecast track guidance from the National Hurricane Center. Zooming in on the cone of uncertainty in the track line for future Amelda, you can see that it is anticipated to be a tropical storm probably right after I post this video. It is anticipated to have 40 mile per hour winds by 8 p.m. tonight on our Saturday. Eventually, there is pretty high confidence that the storm will be paralleling the coast of Florida, but staying east of it in the next 24 to 48 hours. It will also likely be strengthening during that time. Beyond the end of our Sunday and as we go into the early part of the work week, that is where models have always been spreading out on where this system will go. The cone of uncertainty indicates that the storm could be as close to the coastline as basically touching Charleston Harbor there in South Carolina. It could be several hundred miles offshore by the time we get towards Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. The highest confidence track for right now, though, it brings a Category 1 hurricane a few hundred miles offshore and begins curving it to the east. Why is it anticipated to curve east? It is actually thanks to the stronger Hurricane Humberto. That is a Category 4 storm that is skirting north of the Caribbean right now. It is anticipated to pass west of Bermuda, while Imelda will be just off the southeast coast of the U.S. The closeness of the stronger Humberto to Imelda should allow for Imelda to feel the pull of that lower pressure center. That is called the Fujiwara effect and should help it start to at least slide east and away from the coast midweek to late week. That is based off most of the latest guidance, and that is why we see that on the official track. To understand why the official track for this storm has been shifting offshore, here's a look at the latest model tracks for potential Tropical Cyclone 9, which as of the time of this video is now considered a tropical depression. While I did circle a few outlier models that still show a direct landfall and impact to the Georgia or Carolina coast, about 80 to 90 percent of models are now feeling the pull of Humberto expected on this storm. They therefore have it curving out to the east before it can get close enough to make a direct hit. That isn't to say there will be a lack of impacts along the Florida, Georgia, and Carolina coastlines at the minimum. This just means that direct impacts are looking at more likely to be spared as of this video update. With that being said, I think it now makes sense to take a look at the most likely scenario with this storm and what that could mean for parts of the southeast U.S. We're looking at the GFS model because it has been pretty much on par with what other models are showing, as well as with the likely eastward shift that this storm should see from Monday into Tuesday and Wednesday. Starting the playthrough into the Sunday time frame, you can see how the storm is anticipated to make a northbound push. The low pressure center, keep in mind, it is only going to be a couple hundred miles offshore of Florida with this most likely track. That brings the outer edge of likely tropical storm conditions only 50 miles off of Miami, eventually towards Daytona at some point out of Sunday into Sunday night. That could mean with a little bit of a shift that those zones do feel some at least minor tropical storm impacts. Regardless, there should be at least some level of some gusty winds and saltwater inundation at the coast. Rainfall flooding should be less of a concern with Florida unless the storm does indeed grow nearer. Where rainfall flooding still does look to be a concern, that's going to be as early as Monday in the pre-dawn hours in parts of the Georgia and the Carolina coastlines. 2, 3, 4, 5 o'clock Monday morning, that's when this guidance is indicating some of the first heavy rain bands hitting those zones. Of course, as the center of the storm will grow nearer during Monday, we will likely only see more of those heavier bands pushing up and down the Carolina coastlines. This is the area that if we see a landfall will be hit the hardest. This is the area that without a landfall will be hit the hardest. Be prepared for at the minimum fresh water flooding and some gusty winds with even this scenario from Charleston to Wilmington and in points in between. Most likely we will continue to see flooding risks ramp up Monday night as we will get more rainfall bands pushing over parts of the Carolinas. Eventually though into Tuesday that is when the GFS model with this most likely scenario shows Imelda getting that tug from Humberto, that would begin to lessen the rainfall by the time we get towards a late Tuesday evening. We would see less in the way of any saltwater inundation that might have been occurring. We will see any gusty winds begin to push offshore with the scenario, and that would mean dry skies by Wednesday over a lot of the states impacted. 
Again, I'm trying to stress though, while this is a very likely scenario at this point, it is not a guaranteed scenario for the early to mid part of this week. If the storm goes even just a little bit closer within this forecast cone, we could have non-landfall impacts that are still concerning for a lot of Georgia and the Carolinas. That would include more flooding that pushes further inland. That could include more storm surge flooding with the salt water at the coast. We could even see more in the way of gusty winds of tropical storm force trying to get along the coastline if the storm shifts just a bit closer again. That's definitely something we have to watch and keep an eye on. Keeping the most likely scenario in mind, let's see how much rainfall is currently expected to come down with this system in any given part of any state. As we go into Florida first, by the time we get through the end of Monday, that's where we could have seen over an inch of rain over some parts of the immediate Florida East Coast. Once you get inland towards even Orlando, for example, or especially as you go towards the West Coast, you're probably below a half an inch. It's just these east coast zones that I have hashed out where one, two, maybe three or four inches will be possible. Of course, we could get towards the higher end of that range that I just provided if this storm shifts a little closer. Once we go beyond Monday and then especially get through the end of Monday and into Tuesday and Wednesday, that's where we will see this storm likely get close enough to produce multiple inches of rain in the coast of Georgia and then especially in these zones I'm circling in the Carolinas from Raleigh, North Carolina and Columbia, South Carolina all the way down to the coast in points in between two to five inches look widespread with a track a couple hundred miles offshore. If we see this storm only 150 miles offshore or more like 100 miles offshore, that could shift some of those deep maroon and even bluish shades that you see just offshore onto the coast. That would mean eight to 12 inches of rain in some locally higher amounts getting into Charleston or Myrtle Beach or Wilmington, North Carolina. That's still a possibility, so you gotta be prepared. With the data I just provided in mind, I think it's a good time to now recap what I just discussed in terms of possibility of impacts with Imelda during the early to mid part of this week. If you're in that yellow shade on this graphic, I wouldn't be too concerned about anything more than some slight impacts out of this storm. Once you get into that orange shade that includes a lot of eastern Florida, Georgia, and the Carolinas, that's where you should be concerned about at least isolated rainfall-induced flooding. In the red zones, that includes the Carolina coastlines that's where the biggest concern should be regardless of the exact track with the storm gusty winds heavy rainfall and storm surge inundation will be at the largest in those zones regardless of the exact position of the low that means that you need to be prepared and ready to hunker down from charleston to wilmington points in between have i mentioned those areas yet <laughs> By the way, one last thing I want to point out in this Imelda update is that regardless of what Imelda does Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, and how far it gets pulled east by Humberto, it does look like this storm will have the potential, once it moves away, to then actually try to move back. It's not shown on most models, but the usually fairly accurate European model shows the low parked just offshore with most impacts also being offshore Wednesday night into Thursday. However, look at what it has happening once the tug of Humberto begins moving further away out of Thursday afternoon into Thursday evening. It has the storm actually cycling back a bit. Could it end up producing a second wave of flooding and concerns that move back onto the coast later this week or towards the weekend? I wouldn't rule that potential out. That's also something worth watching. Again, the future of this storm is definitely not certain by any means. That leaves me just one brief topic worth talking about to finish this video with. This is actually for the good of anyone in the U.S., and it is a look at temperature anomalies across the country for the coming days. Most zones, especially through the nation's midsection, are anticipated to see well above average temperatures as the jet stream will continue to be very far north. No big dips in the jet stream through a lot of this week over most of the country. One interesting thing, though, is that we could see a backdoor cold front sliding down the East Coast later this week. That could actually have implications on Imelda if it's still around. Regardless, that front is anticipated to sink on through, and it could definitely bring some cooler than average temperatures east of the Appalachians as we finish this week. We will also see some cooler temperatures into some parts of the West in comparison to where it should be for this time of the year. That will be as we see some moisture moving in. Thank you so much for tuning in to this update. Subscribe for more accurate videos from this channel in the future as I track all weather hazards across the United States. Of course, I couldn't have made this video or many of my other ones without help from Weather Bell Model Maps. I was just using them for that temperature anomaly overview, and they look awesome. Check out their free trial link below. Thank you so much for tuning in. Stay safe out there. God bless you. One Nation Weather.